Amen. Are you confident in the goodness of the Lord? Uh, well, if you're not, this is a good place to be, right? To be reminded that God is good in a, in a world that seems to be crumbling apart uh, every second, right? Uh, we are, we are in, a, in a Bible study series on the book of Ephesians, and we've kinda, we're hitting a pivot point this morning. Uh, the first three chapters are powerful. Like Tom talked about last week, Paul's making up words because it's like what God has done is super amazing, super abundant. He's just kind of creating words because they're just phenomenal what God has done. And what God has done has had impact and altered things in the cosmic realms that we don't have access to see with our human eyes. And so sometimes we go, man, that's beyond my thinking. It's hard for me to process, but it's real and it's true. And, uh, and today we're hitting Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul kind of says, in light of all these super amazing things, guess what? You and I got to wake up every morning and we got to live our lives. And uh, we're going to look at six verses today. That's going to be the core of the message this morning. Uh, but honestly, you know, the first verse we could spend like an hour and a half on. Um, our focus today is going to be on Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 6. So let's, let's go to God in prayer and let's see what the Spirit does for us today. Well, Father, we are convinced of your goodness. We are grateful to be able to come in a moment like this and, and just reaffirm how much we love and appreciate you. And we just want to respond to what you've done in our lives with our hearts, with our presence here, with our attentiveness, uh, with our willingness to uh, love our neighbor. Uh, no matter what they think or believe or even how they feel about us. Uh, thank you, God, for the plan that you have had. We've learned about it in the first three chapters of Ephesians. We've, we're just so grateful for how much you care about us and how you've adopted us and provided us with an inheritance. And, and uh, it's, just, it's just so amazing, God, and, and how the church is, is not just a, a, a club that we're supposed to be grateful members of, uh, but it's actually the, the wisdom that you have for this world that is struggling to find where true unity can be found. And uh, Lord, we, we just want to express to you our gratitude this morning. I just pray that you can use whatever is shared from this passage of Scripture to motivate us to walk in a way worthy of the calling we've received. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Let's dive in. Ephesians 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. As a prisoner for the Lord. First of all, anybody enjoy being a prisoner? No. Paul literally is a prisoner. He is literally writing as a prisoner. And so, is he kind of being metaphorical? Sure, a prisoner for the Lord. In, in, in Ephesians 3, verse 13, he talks about being a prisoner, right? And so, but he's trying to say, just because I'm a prisoner, don't be ashamed of me. Because in that culture, why listen to a guy in prison? Wait, where's your pastor? Oh, he's in jail? And he wrote you a letter and you're listening to him? Right? That can, get, that can get, get you a little bit of trouble. But Paul's like, hey, don't worry about it. I know I'm, in, I'm a prisoner, but I'm doing this. You know why I'm in prison? Because I've been preaching about who God is and who Jesus is. And that's why, that's why I'm in this situation. So don't worry about me. And in, in chapter 3, he says, my suffering is actually for your glory. It's to benefit you. That's how Jesus operated. You know what? I'm bound to Jesus. Yeah, I might have Roman chains on me. The Roman government might have me in chains. But you know what? It doesn't matter because I gave my life to Jesus and I'm serving him even from prison. And that's the spirit that Paul had. And what I love about his heart. He didn't, let, he didn't let being put in chains uh, mess up his faith. He just kept trying to hurt, help people. But then what does he say? Then I, I urge you to live a life. Urge you. Some of your translations might say, I plead with you. Some of your translations might be old school, I beseech you. <laughs> we don't use beseech much in our vernacular today, but it's a powerful term. And the more I sat on this one verse, I kept coming back to this urge word. Because this word to me is a word of compassion and a word of concern. And it is not a word of coercion. 
You know what I'm saying? See, I'm now the parent of two adult kids. Can anyone relate to that? There was a time in life when I could say things like, hey, you need to do this right now. No, not in five minutes, right now. You need to do this right now. And, and you know, and, oh, okay, dad, or, or no. And then we go, oh, oh it's going to be like that. Now, you know. <laughs> but I felt very confident in my house that I can and tell you right now, you need to do this. Now they older adults. It's hard to just be like, you are going to do this. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. But it doesn't mean you don't care about your kids. I care about my children, and I want, I want a great life for them. And I find myself in that situation where I can urge. I plead sometimes. I beg. I'm beseeching. But I appreciate that's the heart, I believe, of what Christian leadership is about. Can't nobody force you to do anything. But I hope all of us have the heart, you know what, I'm here. I'm not here because of Jeff or Tom or anybody else. I'm here because of the Lord, first of all. I'm his. No matter where I am, I'm his. All right, and because we're all in this together, I recognize some people might have certain roles, but my role isn't to tell you what to do. Even an apostle didn't tell people what to do. He might insist, he might urge, he might do all these things. But these are words of genuine care and concern. And if we don't have enough care and concern for each other to urge and, and to try to, you know, reason with and influence, uh, what are we doing? Uh, so I, I, I used to shy away from, from those types of things for fear that people would think I'm overstepping my bounds, but I'm getting too old for that. <laughs> if you miss it, you know, and, and I might not be perfect, I might not say it the right way, but I hope I'm coming from a place of I care about you. I'm concerned about you. And if I see something that feels off, that's not scriptural, I'm, I'm going to probably say it with some urging in there. And if I come across a little too messed up, I pray for your forgiveness, and I pray we can be Christians and figure it on out together. Amen. But I, I liked this word, and I like the sentiment behind it. Because I think a good minister is going to do that. Hey, I could go to jail for you. <laughs> I can, I, I can preach to you. I can do all kind of stuff, but you know what I can't do? I can't walk your walk for you. I can't do that. And Paul couldn't either. But he sure did urge him to do something. He said, live your life worthy of the calling. You know, English, our, a lot of our translations live a life. Some of your translation might literally say walk in a way. And that's, the, that's actually the real word he's using is to walk. And that has a lot of traction in the Old Testament and the New. To walk. How do you conduct yourself in your life? That's what this concept to walk means. Uh, not, not, and it, you know what it doesn't mean? It doesn't mean, man, I got a lot going on. And just acknowledge God. Oh, God, yeah, I appreciate you, God. Thank you so much. I love you. Amen. And keep going on. your. No, that's not walking with God. That, that, that's maybe acknowledging that there is a God, that he has a role in your life, but that's not walking with God. Walking with God takes time, right? Yeah. You got to have, a, you slow down a little bit. You exchange things with one another. Don't you love that passage in the Old Testament talking about Enoch? Walk with God. One day God just took him up. Loved walking with him so much that I got to have Enoch with me. But that's what it's all about. It's walking with God. Walk with him. Slow down. Don't be so distracted. Walk with God. Take the time. Connect with him. He wants to walk with you too. That's the kind of God we serve. The problem is, and, and, and I appreciate this, this dude named uh, Parker Palmer. This dude is a Quaker. Uh, uh, you know, don't be thinking about just oatmeal. Quakers have like a spiritual <laughs> heritage, okay? But uh, I appreciate this dude. He said, you know, we got to walk with God. And he was talking about it. He said, but the problem is sometimes we don't know where God wants us to go. And a lot of us don't like walking in that circumstance. But that's just a part of what it means to walk with God. 
Open up your Bible, it's, look at Abraham, and just keep on turning the pages. Hey, I need you to go somewhere. Where am I going? I don't, you'll find out when you get there. <laughs> right? Walking with God it can be a little challenging because we don't know where we're going. So we have to trust that God knows where he's taking us. But the problem is, and like Parker Palmer talked about, he said, the problem is we don't walk like we're on a pilgrimage, which is the way we should be walking. When you're on a pilgrimage, that's like a sacred purpose to your walk. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a sacred purpose. And usually a lot of times the concept of pilgrimage is you kind of doing it along with others. You're kind of walking towards a destination that has spiritual value to it. And you know what? On, on a pilgrimage, you might go hungry every now and then. And on a pilgrimage, you might actually sleep at a hostel and not at the Hilton, if you know what I'm saying. Because, but you understand that that's the way a pilgrimage works. But some of us, we, we, don't, we like that tourism kind of vibe, you know what I mean? We like the curated, uh, all-exclusive experience. And that's kind of the journey we like to get on, where everything is just kind of taken care of. And when it ain't taken care of, then we, oh my, I'm going to write a review. This is not going to happen, you know. <laughs> Others need to know about this. And I just want to encourage us, we need to be on pilgrimage. That's the walk that we own. It's a sacred walk. There's purpose in this walk. Because there's God's presence on this walk. But you know, we got to deal with people too. <laughs> and sometimes that's one of the hardest things to do. But I think if we can correlate that concept of walking on pilgrimage with purpose, God's presence, with God's people, I think that can help us and not get sucked in to having to have the walk be like total ease and comfort the whole time. That is not in the scripture. Because the, not only do we walk, how do we walk? Worthy of the calling that God, you know what? And I've said this a million times, but that was formational stuff for me growing up. My mom laid it down quick and easy and Big Mama did the same thing. I understood what walk worthy of the calling was. The calling is, you my child. And if you go out there and act a fool, it's going to come back on me, and then it's going to come back on you. <laughs> that made a lot of sense to a young brother. <laughs> I'm going to go out there and try to do my best to not act a fool and walk worthy of the calling. Because my mom cooking for me, working hard for me, put me into school, put clothes on my back, pay the bills. Why wouldn't I, you know, I mean, why wouldn't I want to respond with a life that brings respect and honor to my family name? Why wouldn't I want to do that, right? And so I, I kind of got that at an early age, and there was a little bit of, I don't want to get in trouble either. <laughs> That's kind of in there, you know? But I, I just want to encourage us to, to walk in a way <laughs> worthy of what Jesus has done for us. That, that, that calling, you know. You know, well, well, Jeff, what has Jesus done for you? Read Ephesians 1 through 3. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. There's terms in Ephesians 1 through 3 that blow your mind. Yeah. You know, Jesus being willing to die for us and forgive us of our sins. God giving us, uh, first of all, adopting us and giving us an inheritance. Sealing with us with his own spirit to guarantee what is to come. Like, wow, we got guarantees. We got protection. We got an inheritance. We got adoption into God's family. My goodness, why wouldn't I want to live like this? To bring God honor, right? And so I just want to encourage us. We've all received that calling, and we received it. We didn't do nothing to make it happen. We didn't earn it. We received the calling, right? We received it. It was given to us. How can we, how can we then turn around and, and not live a life that would bring honor to God? So I, I, I believe this one, this is just one verse, guys. I, I just think it's helpful for us to focus in on that because our problem can be this can be a problem. So I want to urge you <laughs> to live your life based on the truths of Ephesians 1 through 3 instead of the struggles maybe that you experience at 320 Austin Avenue, right? <laughs> Which is the address of right here. <laughs> all right? Because that's the challenge. <laughs> we know all these great spiritual truths that go on in the Bible. And then we look around sometimes we go, well, I'm not experiencing that at North River or and then, then you got a challenge right there, right? 
So I just want to encourage you, just because you might have a challenge here at 320 Austin Ave, it don't mean that Ephesians 1 through 3 doesn't work. So where are you focused? Where are you focused? Are you, are you trying to live a life worthy of the calling at North Ri Hold up, hold up, you know, because there's things that might go down here that aren't perfect. But man, read Ephesians 1 through 3 and, and be inspired. And let that motivate how you walk with God. Because the church is going to have all kinds of issues and problems. And it, it, it happens. Read the Bible. The Bible wouldn't be written if the church was perfect. So how do we walk? How do we do it? What's the practical? Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. My wife has been memorizing Ephesians. She, I think she's up to three or four chapters. She's been doing the voice. I love that. Tolerate one another in an atmosphere thick with love. Man. That is what it means to walk in a way worthy of the calling that we've been given. And so I, I, I sat and I reflected on this. And recently I had to teach a class in the Atlanta School of Missions about God and, you know, the Old Testament. And uh, one of the things that, you know, we looked at was the, the moment in the Old Testament where God has a, a moment of kind of self-expression with Moses. It's not, it's not somebody writing about God. It's a moment when, when God says, this is, who I, this is who I am, you know? And what words does he use? Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, Rebecca. You see these words? This is... Old Testament God, same God, by the way, but let's just say, this is, and this is him expressing himself in his own words. Think about what God could have said. I'm omnipotent. I'm omnipresent. I'm omniscient. He could have said stuff like that. He could have. Almighty. <laughs> Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, forgiving. This is God's self-expression in Exodus. And then I thought, you know, Jesus didn't talk about himself a lot, didn't, you know, kind of lift himself up a lot. But there was a time he gave a little self-expression into his character. Hmm. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am what? And what? Wow. Of all the things Jesus could have said about himself. Hmm. I'm gentle. And I'm humble. God the Father, Jesus the Son. Do you know that when you really realize who you're living for and you want to honor God with the walk of your life, and when you are baptized into Jesus and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you really yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, do you know that God's Spirit will actually bear fruit in your life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do you see? <laughs> We're not making this up. Why do we sometimes fight for some kind of brash, arrogant, smartest guy in the room, tell everybody how they're wrong, I'm always, why do we even do that? Like, why would we need to be that way? When that's nowhere near the God of the scriptures, Jesus, who's God in the flesh, and the spirit. <laughs> so I think we could do a really good job to focus in on these qualities. <laughs> to me, that's walking in a way worthy of the calling. This is the wisdom of God to actually, to actually create a people, diverse, all kind of people, right? Bring them all into one family and exhibit all those qualities in imitation of God. Because if, if we could be that, we show the world something different. 
And that's what Ephesians 1 through 3 says. The church is the wisdom of God to, to show what God can do. He's, he's able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. He can actually create a people that live like this. Like that are motivated to walk like that. They don't have to be coerced or forced. They, they, they bear this fruit in life. They live this way. They don't go, oh, that's unrealistic. Or, you know, you could get in trouble or you might go to jail or you might get hurt. They don't care. People live like that because they know they have an inheritance. They know God's with them. And they can live this way. Man, I want to be that way. I struggle some days to be that way. I ain't going to lie. But I know, I love, I love to know that that's the, the calling. That's the calling. And I hope that we can have this humility. What does it mean to be humble? You know, literally, it means low-minded. What in the world? You can't even define this word without using the word low. Right? We don't like low. We like high. Every chart that we want associated with us is going, you know, like up, progressively up. We don't like any chart unless it's cholesterol or something like that that's going down. <laughs> But that's the direction of Jesus, constantly willing to go down, constantly willing to lo lower himself, to empty himself, to make himself nothing, the trajectory to go low, to die for you. Wow, that's, what, that's the core of, how do we, we got to be completely like that. Oh man, that's hard to do, I know. But don't just try to white knuckle it, yield to God and his spirit will bear that kind of fruit in you. Be gentle. That's like power under control, right? That's strength not of muscle, but of character. Do you know what I'm saying? That's the person that could do something, but restrains. That kind of, that, wow, so this lowliness, this, this gent, this power under control, you know, this patience, and, and, it's, and it's long patience. This is the long suffering word, right? Long term patience. Wow. And bearing with each other literally means to hold up or to put up with. Ooh, we're going to have to do a lot of that, guys. H hold up. You hold up somebody as you're patient with them, as you're low in mind and spirit and condition, and, you're, you know, and you hold them up and you put up with them. That's what God died to create. And that's exactly what we're not seeing in this world today. It's not. We're not, we're not seeing this in our country, especially in our country. We're not seeing it. We're not seeing this lived out. Where is the church? Where is our witness right now? To be, to be patient, long-term patience with somebody else. How humble are we? Or are we so convinced that we know exactly how the world should work, how this country needs to operate, and we're going to tell the other person exactly why, and when they don't believe what we believe, we're just going to cut them, cut them off, cancel them, whatever the word is, and move on and do something else. There's too much of that going on. And it, it should not be happening in the church, but the sad thing is, it, it is happening in the church. But this is the way we need to be living. And we all need to memorize this. I urge you, I beseech you to memorize this. <laughs> We're almost done. Six verses today. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. Be diligent, some of your translations. Endeavor, some of your translations. To keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. The spirit has already created the unity. We don't create the unity. We're supposed to keep it or maintain it and work hard at it. <laughs> and, and notice he doesn't say, you know, make every effort to have a spirit of unity among you. No, not a spirit of unity. No, that's like camaraderie or it would be great to have team chemistry. We, maybe we could win the championship. No, no. It's not a spirit of unity. It's the unity that the spirit already has created. And we need to maintain it. That's our role. How do we maintain it? <laughs> be humble. Be patient with each other. Be gentle. Show that to the world through the bond of peace. 
And the problem is we, 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 we got to watch out, guys. We got to be careful that we're not making every effort to do other things. <laughs> All right? God doesn't need a, a progressive Supreme Court or a conservative Supreme Court to c- accomplish what he wants to accomplish. God doesn't need Democrats running the House or the, or the Senate or Republicans running either one uh, in order for his plans to work. He doesn't need America to do anything in order for his plans to work. He doesn't. So why in the world are we sitting up here hitching our emotional wagons to stuff God might not hear? God can do what he's going to do without all that stuff. But we have hitched our mental, ethical, moral, emotional baggage onto some of this stuff, bring it into the church, and then try to tell somebody else they're not really a Christian unless they believe what I believe about this stuff. What in the world is that? That's insane. That's crazy. So you're bringing in stuff from the outside. Economic, uh, oh, if we don't have this economic policy, then there's no way God can do what he needs to do in this country because this is a Christian country. Wow, okay. So now, now all of a sudden, if somebody doesn't agree with you, how are you going to treat them? How, no, let, let me ask you, how are you going to treat somebody that doesn't agree with you on the economic policy you think the country needs to have? Yep. Are you going to be humble with them? Are you going to take the low spirit road? Or are you going to tell them what they need to know? It's hard to do. I know it. it's hard, man, I'm telling you. Because when I do these sermons, I got to look at myself first before I get up here and talk to y'all. It's hard for me. Because I think we're all tempted to live from a certain place that has nothing to do with the unity of the spirit. I am. I'm tempted to, like, my starting place so often, man, I'm telling you. It's hard. I see it in me. It's hard for me to not wake up every day and, and, and view the world through the prism of being a black man. It's hard. And so when somebody, it might be you, come at me with something I think <laughs> is, is not the way I view the world or it's harmful to me as a black man, it's, it's, a, it's a moment for me. Right? <laughs> okay, I just, I'm just being ripped. So if, that, if that's my starting place, it is going to be really hard for me to be completely humble with all of you. And it's going to be an obstacle to put up with you, long suffering with you. It's going to be hard for me. If, if that is who I feel like I need to show the world or I need to defend my blackness before, or my maleness or the fact that I grew up in Texas. Or, you know, I mean, we can just choose a bunch of other stuff. And some of us are doing that. We, we, since we don't realize it, I think, and that's the problem. I don't think some of us realize that's what we're doing. We're, we're not in Christ anymore. We are starting, I'm in Republican. I'm in Democrat. I'm in this economic policy. I'm in, I'm in pro-Palestinian. I'm in pro-Israeli. I'm in, just choose, a, choose it. But you, it seems like that's where you're starting from, and then you emanate from there, and then you add on Christian wisdom or whatever. To, to fortify your argument or whatever, to help make yourself feel better that actually this is the way God would do it. You're not keeping the unity of the spear. Because you know what? I appreciate Paul, man. It's like he said so many things, and this he just gets straight up easy on you. What is the unity of the spirit? All right, let me help you out. There's one God. I mean, he just like, this is so straightforward. One body. Do we agree? Yes. Is there one spirit? Yes. Okay. Were you called to one hope when you were called? Yes. Okay. How many lords are there? One. How many faiths? One. How many baptisms? One. How many gods? One. Do you agree? Yes. Let's live our life from there. Amen. Why is that not our starting place? With a spirit of humility and gentleness and love, why are we not fighting for the unity of the church instead of fighting an argument about 80 years from now, nobody even going to know who the heck was running for nothing right now. But you sincerely will allow separation between you and a brother or a sister based on what's going on out there, even though we just sat here and said all this stuff we agree with. What is up with that? That's because the power and principalities of this world, that's how they work. That's how they work. They get you in there. You know, they get you thinking that you're right and everybody else is wrong. 
Your view is the way that everybody else needs to see, even in the church. If I, I need to talk to the pastor, and he, he need to preach about this stuff so everybody can understand it. <laughs> that, so you tell me that's completely humble. I'm telling you, we got to watch out. I appreciate Chrissy. We were talking about this. She goes, man, we used to talk about this one body and all that, like an, an exclusionary, like just to prove that there's one, one church. She's like, man, that scripture's unifying people together, you know? I said, good point, honey. That is true. It's powerful. I just pray we can reflect on this kind of stuff. If we can make every effort to wrestle the bears of our own junk to be honest about our leanings and how they affect the way we view this world and how they keep us from actually maintaining the unity of the spirit. If we can just really learn how to talk to each other through that in the church, then we, then we got something to show the world. But if I look at somebody with a MAGA hat on and if I go there in my heart and go, I will never, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Or if you see somebody wearing a Biden hat and you go, I just, how can you as a Christian represent a person like that? If, if that's where we are, if that's where we are, we got problems. But, but, if that's where we are, the world has a solution. Let's be part of the solution. So we'll have discussion questions for you on the website. Amen. Amen. I wish we were all in a home with food around us. Wish we could all talk about Jesus together. Take the wine and the bread. But we're not going to do that. We haven't figured that one out yet. You have to be long-suffering with us. <laughs> but I am going to say a prayer. And we will try our best to remember Jesus take the Lord's Supper like other people who believe these one things that are doing it all over the world that believe the same one things that I just put up on the screen we're going to join them as that spiritual family let's pray to God <clears throat> Father help us Lord help me Golly. oh Lord I just pray that we can remember Jesus gentle and humble in heart <clears throat> Willing to die for what is true and right mm. for, the benefit of, for the benefit of us. We remember that sacrifice and we remember the power that you exerted that raised him from the dead and has him seated at your right hand. And we are grateful for your plan, God, for the church, your wisdom, what the resurrection has accomplished, and the hope that we have that one day, one day, at some point, Jesus will return and set all this straight. And we just thank you for that. And until then, we take the bread that represents Jesus' body. We drink this juice that represents his blood. And we do this with a proclamation in our hearts that we are connected to one another in this room. And we are connected with you through your spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.